Um, so to start, you know, I think it might be interesting for people here to know that um, this is not actually the book that you plan to write. Can you, uh, the book that you plan to write that we first, um, you know, wrote a proposal about was was a math book. Um, what happened? Yes. <laughs> so, the answer, yes. Yes. So this is a common question: is why did you write this book? And there's an interesting story here. So what I wanted to do was I actually wanted to write a math book. And I wanted to write a math book to convey my love of mathematics and show how beautiful math is to the, a general audience. And while Penguin liked the idea, they he said, we really like this idea, but we really want to see more of yourself in this. And we think that readers will really appreciate the math that they see more if you put more of yourself into it. And of course, you can't talk about yourself without also talking about yourself holistically. So we think you should talk about math and football. And you know, we sent a draft in, and they said, no, a little less math. <laughs> more of yourself and eventually we came to the final product that many of you have in your hands and I am happy to say that uh, Penguin was right in that this is the perfect book in that in that it conveys math to a broad audience and to a big audience that perhaps wouldn't even dream of picking up a book that contains any mathematics. And in that respect, sort of, Penguin was absolutely right that it's important that I talked about myself holistically. That I talked about not just my journey with mathematics, but my journey with football. One thing that I, I find um, interesting, though, when I, you know, knowing you as I do, is that football also did um, instill certain values and sort of, it did contribute to your life in a way that math never could have. Um, and, you know, there's a way in which um, they are actually complementary. And can you speak a little bit about, like, what it is that, because we're going to talk a lot about that, don't worry. Yes. What it is, what was it that, that football brought you in your life? Yes, yeah, so first of all, football taught me a lot of lessons, I would say. I, uh, I have to say that, first of all, at Penn State, this was really the place where where I sort of became the man I am today, that you know really formed me not as not just as a football player but as a mathematician. And I was talking to my uh, former strength and conditioning coach at Penn State, and I was talking to him uh, yesterday. We were texting, and he was you know wishing me well with the book. And I had to let him know that okay, he was training me as a football player, but as you'll read in the book, and we we really sort of. We toned it down for the book because we don't want anyone getting into trouble, but he really worked hard and he was really on me when I was sort of there early on because he thought I had a lot of potential. And he taught me how to be tough. What does this mean? How to be mentally tough. How to sort of stay the course and stay focused and continue doing something when you're tired and you don't feel like doing it feel like I couldn't possibly do anymore and sort of every muscle in your body is telling you to quit, to keep going. And I was talking to him yesterday and I was telling him that yes, this really helped me in football, but he had such a great impact on my math career because he's the person who taught me how to be resilient as a mathematician. How when I'm trying to solve some math problem, and it's a very hard problem. I've been working at it for weeks and weeks. And I'm trying all these different things. And I keep failing again and again and again. Not to get discouraged and to stay the course and to keep plugging away and keep working when other people want to leave. And this is just one example of something that football has given me that's been useful as a mathematician. That, um, that idea that math is full of failure um, is actually some, one of the first things you told me about being a mathematician. I think you said that, um, you know, when you're a mathematician, you um, you can expect to fail 99 times out of 100, and then you'll probably fail the 100th time, too. <laughs> um, do you ever get used to it? 
Yes, I mean, you, it's a failing. <laughs> yes, so it, it is very different from football in that way. It's sort of in football, you, you never get comfortable with failure. But in math, you have to you have to learn that failure is sort of just a step, sort of on the way to sort of solving a problem. And I've uh, I've been doing a lot of media since the book came out, and one of the things I've really tried to talk to people about with respect to math is that a lot of people had trouble with math. A lot of people got to a point and decided they weren't math people, or that math was very hard. And what I often tell people is that the mistake is that thinking math wasn't hard in the first place. <laughs> and I'm serious, because math is not easy. It's not easy for me. It's hard. It takes a lot of hard work. You're trying to understand something that's foreign to you, you're going to struggle. And that struggle is good. That struggle is what helps you sort of when you finally understand it. Understand it more holistically because you really had to fight to get there rather than someone just telling you the answer or just telling you the formula. And I would say that often there's a culture of, in math, we're going to learn some formula or some algorithm to do something. We're going to memorize it. We're going to do it 30 times on the homework. And then we're going to do it on the exam. And then let's move on. And sort of the conclusion you take is that the result is somehow doing this on the exam, passing your exam, and finishing this, checking a box, and moving on. When the true result is actually the process of learning this material, the process of fighting with it and struggling with it and eventually understanding. This is the process that makes people better thinkers. This is the process that makes people able to reason quantitatively. And I always sort of compare it to, as silly as it sounds, solving a crossword puzzle. No one here is going to try to tell me that crossword puzzles are easy. Well, some crossword puzzles are really easy. Okay. <laughs> Most crossword puzzles are not extremely easy. You know, you struggle with them, and it takes a lot of time. But would you ever dream of, say, let's say, having an empty crossword puzzle and just saying, wow, let me just go find the answer somewhere, and let me just fill in the letter in every little box? It's not about the completed crossword puzzle you have. That doesn't do anything for you. There's no joy in that. The joy is that you're filling it in. You're trying to think about these things. You're struggling to say, okay, this is 12 across now. How do I use seven down to get this? You're sort of, it's that struggle of getting to the end. That's why people are doing crossword puzzles. You don't get paid to do crossword puzzles. You do them because somehow it's this process that you enjoy. And I think the importance of focusing on the process rather than the result in mathematics is it really can't be overstated because once your mindset sort of shifts, now all of a sudden when you face something that's really hard, you say, wow, this is really hard, but I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to struggle through this because I'm used to this. Could you actually, as I, as I listen to you, I'm wondering, could you use another analogy? Could you actually use the analogy of, um, of sports or football? Because no football coach is ever going to say, hey, football's really easy. Like, the reason you should play is that you're just going to, like, hang out in the sun, like, maybe make some friends. Like, a lot of sports are really, really hard, right? And people don't play them in order to... Um, I mean, there are a million different reasons to play a team sport, but generally, because it's easy, is not one of them. But, you know, one thing I'm also wondering, let's say you are really bad at math, yes. right? And um, you're here to tell me that I should love math. I'm really bad at math, let's say. And you're here to tell me why. So I know I'm yes. going to have to struggle, and you struggle too, but, like, yes. why should I love it? So, I or think... Shape and, like, like it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, love it is strong. I hope that you sort of grow to like the concept of trying to struggle 
to get to some level of understanding because I think, you know, many things in life are sort of along the lines of you're trying to get towards some goal. And if you, if all you think about is, man, I just can't wait till I get to this goal. I can't wait till I'm finally there and I've achieved this thing. You're really missing out on a lot. And I think this is just a bad mindset to have in life. And I will admit, I do think that, yes, there are some people who might be better at math than other people. This is a thing. But I think even if you aren't the strongest person at math, I'm not saying you have to take calculus. What I'm saying is that the math that you do take is important because it's training you how to think, how to think quantitatively. I don't care, let's say, if you are a person and you know you're not going into, let's say, a scientific field. If you do not remember your trig identities, I do not care. I really don't. I'm going to level with you. I'm not that good at remembering my trick identities. But what I do care about is that no matter what profession you may have, I care that you're able to make good, well-reasoned decisions. I care that when someone tells you something, a piece of information, maybe a statistic, you're able to take what they tell you and ask yourself, do I believe this? and be able to think logically about things people tell you. You'll be able to, let's say, take a statistic that is true and maybe take a step back and say, is the conclusion that I'm immediately drawing from this statistic, does it actually follow from the statistic I've been told? Or are there hidden variables? Are there things that I'm not thinking about? Is this somehow misleading? And uh, I know I'm here sort of advertising our book, but uh, sort of one great book that sort of talks about this idea and the power of sort of having a mathematical training, even if you aren't working in a scientific field, is Jordan Hellenberg's How Not to Be Wrong. And he talks about the power of being able to understand information that people tell you. And this sort of, uh, I would call it, like a quantitative literacy. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't call it like numeracy, I would say just like a quantitative literacy. And this is what I hope everyone gets out of mathematics. I mean, there's also, um, sometimes math, it can be fun too, right? Like you can have some interesting logic games and surprising results and... I mean, okay, it depends on your concept of fun, but for me, math is, <laughs> math is quite fun. No, it's, it's, it's quite fun. But, Different people think different things are fun, and you know, I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, there actually is fair warning, there should be a warning label on the book. Um, there is a tiny bit of math in the book. <laughs> there is just a little bit. A tiny bit. We, we were like negotiating the number of <laughs> equations, equations and figures. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, the people at Penguin, they were, they were telling me sort of, you know, complicated models for... Uh, like book sales versus number of equations. The way it looked was something along the lines of uh, book sales, number of equations. And, uh, yes, so they, they fought with us a little bit about the equations, but I think I got all the important ones in there. And even when we didn't have equations, we were able to sort of talk about some interesting mathematical ideas in a very easy <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I the idea is to be readable. I actually thought maybe we could even have a little bit of fun. One of the, the problems in the book is called the, the birthday problem. It's actually quite famous. And there are so many people here that, um, just to illustrate like some of the quirky things that math can do. Yeah. So, um, the basically- Wait, do you, do you, are we doing this? Yeah, I'm just gonna, not exactly. <laughs> but like, so show people, you know. Okay. But note that it's probability. Yeah, it's probability. So we could be wrong. We could be wrong. <laughs> this, could not, this is actually very this will, important. This is very important to understand probability. This will most likely work very well, but it could just go horribly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask everyone's birthday. And Ellie, you have a piece of paper. And actually, we should do it as restricted because. What? Yeah. So the I mean part of the point of the birthday, like you can do just like this area. Yeah, yeah. But I'm going to go and I'm going to. Just, okay. But you have to tell me. How about you guys keep track? Tell me when two people have the same birthday. Okay? What's your birthday? January 4th, 
Actually, you tell me when I get to you if you hurt your birthday. Okay. That's the right thing. <laughs> August 11th. June 19th. August 11th. Oh, wait, is that <laughs> Perfect. Wow. Good. Wow. So, <laughs> it was not supposed to, I mean, okay, it can happen that quickly. <laughs> probability, probability at work, exactly. But uh, as crazy as it sounds, once you hit about uh, 30-some people, you've got a, a pretty good chance that two people have the same birthday, even though there's 365 days a year, which is, which is a surprising thing to a lot of people. Did not expect it to go that well. <laughs> this is the power of randomness. <laughs> um, okay, so one of the other things I know that um, you talk about in the book and that we talk about, um, you know, just at home is that um, it would be great um, if, like, math education, there was more kind of cultural awareness of math, you know, that there was more exposure to um mathematicians, more, there's more kind of, uh, not only like quantitative, um, literacy, but like cultural quantitative literacy, if that makes any sense. Um, and I was just wondering if you could speak, um, who are some of the people and what are some of the ideas that you wish that, you know, kids in schools knew or, or the, everyone in this room knew? Yes. So, as well, it's my point. Do we work with the yeah. It is, it is okay. I can't do it too well. Uh, so... First of all, one of the tough things about mathematics that I'm not sure I can think of another field, another sort of fundamental subject that you learn in school, is that everyone knows what people use English for at a very high level. People know authors, right? People sort of know, like, physicists. People know biologists. People know chemists. I mean, they know the concept of them, at least. People know historians. People studying math, most often, do not know mathematicians. They don't know what a mathematician is. They don't know what a mathematician does, and I think it's a very powerful thing to just be good at a subject like math and to be able to see in your classroom just a poster showing you this is... Few math, these are a few mathematicians. This is what they look like. They look like normal people. <laughs> these are the things they do. They come in all shapes and sizes, and genders, and colors, and backgrounds, and ages. And what do they do? Some of them are professors doing research. Some of them are working for Google or Amazon, creating algorithms to streamline our world. One of the co the co, the co founder of Google, uh, Sergey Brin, the sort of main Google search algorithm. This is a math algorithm. If you guys aren't familiar with it, go home and look up Pedro. It's uh, you know this is a very fundamental sort of math algorithm that underpins all of sort of Google's sort of search capabilities. I mean, look at. The people at the uh, NSA, I mean, okay, I don't know how, some, pe some people feel s certain ways about the NSA, but the NSA claims to be the single largest employer of mathematicians. This is something that mathematicians do. What else do mathematicians do? Well, you know, they create algorithms, you know, for computer science, they solve tough open problems in academia. They, uh, I don't know what the NSA does. If I did, I couldn't say, but they do that. <laughs> and, you know, they also, turns out mathematicians are quite good at making money. They, they work on Wall Street. And, I mean, they don't make any, they don't make much more than money, but they make a lot of money for people and for themselves. And it turns out being a mathematician is a very rich profession that has so many applications, especially... I think, in sort of the uh, 21st century, as this century progresses. And uh, I don't think that's known. And I think it's very hard to aspire to be something or aspire to do something if you don't know what that something is or you can't even picture someone who does that thing. And I think we're probably right around 30 minutes. Five more minutes or so. Five more minutes. 
Um, do you feel a kind of special responsibility being an African American mathematician to, in line with what you're saying, you know, to um, be someone that kids can look up to? Yeah, absolutely. I. Uh, this is probably going to take up all of the five minutes. Right? <laughs> you know, because this is this is an, it's it's an interesting topic. And why is this? Well, first of all, I have to say that me being African American, well, I'm going to say the obvious. Me being African American has absolutely nothing to do with my ability to do math. It's completely unrelated. And I have to say, me being African American has had nothing to do with my math career. Absolutely nothing. And sort of my whole math upbringing, and you'll read about this in the book, math was always a very personal thing for me. My experience was, with math wasn't learning math in a classroom with a bunch of people. It was me learning at home. A very personal experience of me in a math book or a math workbook and really having this intimate relationship with this knowledge. And Can we credit, though, John's mom? Yes, my, my mother, of course, is, is very important. She's the one who sort of gave me these resources. And because of that, I never really, you know, I would look around sort of the field of mathematics, the classes I'm in, the other mathematicians in my department, none of them African-American, and I didn't really pay attention to this because my sort of interaction with mathematics was me in math. It wasn't me with sort of a group of people in math. And I'll say, first of all, there's hardly any African-American mathematicians. And I will say that it's not because MIT is just like looking around and they're saying, wow, there's so many African-American mathematicians, but we don't really feel like hiring any of them. <laughs> this is not what's going on. What's going on is there's just not many of us. And what's causing there to be not many of us, this isn't something that's you know happening at the PhD level or the college level. You're seeing these numbers sort of being extremely small sort of as soon as students step foot on a college campus. And there's something happening in our country where it's not just African-American or white, it's that somehow all of the brilliant American mathematicians that you see fit a certain mold, disproportionately so. And so you're left with the sobering realization that there's so many brilliant young minds being born into this country, being born into households where they don't have sufficient education, where they don't have sort of, where their social culture isn't one that values education. And we're having brilliant young minds being lost and it's not just a disservice to them, it's a disservice to us as a country. And sort of to finish this rambling answer to your question, I would say while sort of my identity as an African American has really had nothing to do with my math career, I'll say that uh, I realize I am the exception in that I've talked to a lot of African American mathematicians, especially since I've been at MIT because MIT is sort of a uh, it's very much a hub for mathematics. A lot of mathematicians come through MIT. I've had the chance to talk to a lot of African-American undergrad math majors. And I've sort of witnessed a sort of a sentiment that they feel this. And they feel that they're the only sort of African-American person in all of their classes. And they feel that they're behind everyone else. They don't know the material as well as everyone else because they feel like they weren't as prepared in high school as all the other people in the class, the other kids in class, you know, they were competing in international math Olympiad and other things. And when they feel like they're behind and no one else is, and they're also the only African American in the class, these two things together can be very isolating. And uh, I have to admit that, you know, it can be tough for some people, and so I do recognize as an African-American mathematician, I have a role to play in this, and I like to think the biggest role I have to play is by just being a mathematician, by just being myself, but uh, this is definitely something that I'm very aware of, and I think it's probably about time to open it up sure. to questions.
Come to the microphone, please. Yes, we have, we have two microphones, one over here by the water cooler and one over here by this post. Yes, I'm, this is fine? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Right. So you like struck a lot of things that I wanted to ask you about. Okay. <laughs> the first thing, you were talking about education. I work for an early education, an early childhood education company, and just trying to get the, the just the love of learning into kids, into children these days is really difficult, as you mentioned, just not coming from um, a place where they value education or even where they have the resources. And so you, you need to start at that young age to get them involved. Um, and then as a mother of a seventh grader, the last few years have been really challenging for me. I'm one of those people that did not like math growing up. I felt like I really liked it and then I wasn't, I was told that, oh, you're not good enough to be in that class now. And at that point, I'm like, okay, fine. If I'm not good enough to be in that class, I don't want to learn anymore, which was, I know, shooting myself in the foot. But, you know, rote learning, back in the 70s and 80s, it was all rote learning math. And my son is learning math a lot differently, which I kind of wish I had that opportunity to, because getting to that understanding of how you get to that solution is just really important. And so I know there's a lot of people complaining about how math is taught these days and it's all common core and it's not that. But I was just curious, what do you see yourself getting involved in any kind of that educational aspect of it or trying to be an advocate for that, getting math out there so that kids can learn to love it? Uh, yes, in, uh, in a number of ways, but also no in some ways. So first of all, no, I don't think I'm ever going to be actively involved in changing math education policy. I'm <clears throat> just not. But what I do want to do is, one, I want to, first of all, teach young people what a mathematician is. I think this is an important step. Two, I want to try to start to give teachers resources. I want to make it easier for math teachers because math teachers do not have an easy job and it's tough and you, you know, you don't really get, you don't get a pat on the back for everything you do. You don't get a great deal of support and I think that the mathematics community has a responsibility to math teachers to inform them and give them sort of the necessary resources and I think sort of to this point I don't think we've done a sufficient job of this, and I want to be a part of this, and I'm trying to start to be a part of this. One of the things that I do want to do in the coming months is I actually want to try to start some sort of online resource where in one place, if you're a math teacher, you can go, you can go somewhere, you can look, and you can see a list of a ton of great resources in terms of here are a bunch of posters from a ton of different places, from the American Math Society, from the Mathematical Association of America, that because you're a teacher, just ask for one, and they'll send you one for free. Resources in terms of, here are summer programs that your students can take part in if you think they're talented, and they might have an interest in pursuing more math. Here are 20 different resources in the description of each. Uh, if you think your students might be interested in sort of reading mathematics outside of the classroom. Different books and different puzzle books that could be really useful to your young people and what levels they should be for. And just sort of resources, videos, content to use in classrooms. I don't think sort of a resource like this exists and I do think I'd like to try to create it this summer if I have. And, uh, in between your PhD. In between my PhD. I mean, PhD, I'm sure my advisor is watching. PhD takes precedence, but <laughs> in, my, like, in my little free time, I'll sort of you know, chip away at this. And uh, also one way I want to have an impact on sort of younger people is one of the ways that math really captured me was through puzzles. And this is one way that I do want to try to sort of capture the, uh, the attention of sort of bright young I suppose we should pause for this. Thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, full disclosure, I happen to be a chemistry professor and scientist, but I also happen to be female. So I, um, I 
I see a lot of myself in what you have described as being sometimes you're the only person like you in the room. Um, so I appreciate your thoughts on that. And that's kind of a whole separate topic. But what I also sort of resonated with is the idea that um, you know, nobody knows what a cool mathematician looks like. Nobody knows what a cool modern chemist looks like or a cool modern biologist. And when you try to convince young people that this is a cool thing to go into that's not medicine or forensic science, they don't know what that looks like, right? It's not on TV, not NCIS or ER or whatever's on TV, right? Um, and so I, I guess it's sort of a half comment, half question. I was interested in your thoughts on, on changing that culture because you're exactly right. Before they go to college, you know, that, that's, that's it's, it's a loss cause when they're freshmen. Are you aware of of sort of movements of foot to, to make science cool? That sounds really cliche, but um, but on TV and in so, so that more kids, more bright more of those bright folks will go in that direction rather than law. Nothing against the doctors or the lawyers in the room. <laughs> um, yeah, no, this is a great question and I think, you know, while sort of it's tough to do sort of at a large scale sort of in media one of the easiest ways to do this in a classroom is actually through posters. I am serious. Like, uh, sort of, there are these posters that, uh, at least in the math community, that uh, they have these posters like uh, Black and Mathematically Gifted, showing you know a ton of different African American mathematicians and what they look like. They look like people. The things they do. Uh, they have sort of the American Math Society has posters of different mathematicians, and uh, believe it or not, when a student is in a classroom for a full like calendar year, they aren't always paying attention in class. <laughs> Sometimes their eyes wander, and often their eyes wander sort of like, oh, what's on the, what's on the side of the room, and they look at things. And you wouldn't believe, so the American Math Society did a poster with me on it. And it's in a bunch of classrooms. And you wouldn't believe how many messages I get from high school students saying that they would look at my poster all the time. <laughs> and it would sort of give them inspiration that they could do math too. Or just that they, uh, you know, they really connected with that. And I think just, just something as simple as that, where they can put a face, a modern face, a face that looks like someone who might live right next door to them, to a career, I think that already makes more difference. I actually, um, I have a, a we, one of our friends is um, uh, the fiance of a, a professor at MIT math, and what, she and one of her friends made a poster of um, female scientists and put it in the MIT bathroom. And, <laughs> Karen did this? Yeah. Oh, okay. And um, they, the MIT, like, I don't know, someone at MIT got so much response about it that they reached out um, to them and gave them a grant, like gave them money actually to make poster new, a new poster every month because even actually these women at, at MIT felt like they had a hunger, you know, to see this kind of messaging because it wasn't something that they got elsewhere. Uh, hi, so I teach math here in a district and um, <coughs> I have a lot of students who are really into math and they work hard in class and want to do well. Maybe they want to get good grades or they also sort of just like are interested in it. But uh, my question is about, um, you, you seem to have kind of been able to pursue multiple passions. You're able to really work towards football and math at, at a really high level, which is hard to do. Um, so I was wondering if you have any advice for, as I feel like nowadays to get to college, just in general, there's more specialization. Like if you're good at this thing, you should put all your energy into this one thing. You know, if you are great at soccer, play all year round soccer. And like, and I think people are pulled in a certain direction. So how are you able to balance both of those? So first of all, I have to admit that uh, I don't think I was that well rounded. <laughs> I, you know, people talk about you know, you're very good at something, go all in on this. I have to say that uh, first of all, you don't have to sort of go all in whatever your passion is. You can sort of have have broad interests. You can do multiple <laughs> things. I think this is a very good and healthy thing to do. I did not have the healthiest personality when I was a young person. I was very sort of, uh, very, 
very intense. I'm like, this is, I think this is what happens. Like, uh, I think once I met Louisa, I became a much calmer person. Do you agree? Yes. Yes. <laughs> So I was extremely intense, extremely competitive, and I have to say, it was not that I was well-rounded, it was that I really loved math and football, and I was so intense about these two things, I was just so determined, these are the only two things I'm going to do. I'm going to do them at such a high level. I love both of these things, and I would say that it's okay, I think, within reason, if you really, really love something, to really just dive in say, I'm going to be great. Now, depending on what that thing is, it might be very important that you make sure that you don't shirk your sort of academics because maybe this thing that you're trying to go all in and all in on doesn't pay the bills, you will only pay the bills until you're 30, and you need, you know, you need something to fall back on, in which case, you know, you need to keep up with your education, but uh, no, I was, I was not well-rounded, I was very much all in on both of these things, and the way, the reason that I was able to do sort of both of these things at a very high level, sadly, when you read the book, there's no sort of secret, there's no like, no list of ways to be there's that no way. special <laughs> formula. I mean, the secret is, you know, there's no secret. It takes a lot of hard work, a lot of determination, and frankly, just a lot of sacrifice. You know, there's, there's, that is the secret. There's no, there's no secret. I mean, I, uh, I mean, this wasn't the question that you were asking me, but uh, I will sort of paraphrase that I do get this question a lot. Often, you know, from a lot of people who, you know, are trying to sort of pursue something at a high level, they always sort of ask me, what's the secret? You know, if only, you know, I knew the secret and I, I really sort of like simultaneously love, but hate to break it to them that yes, you know, you need to be intelligent with your time. Yes, you need to sort of do all these things, but there is absolutely no substitute for just plain old hard work. Yes. Um, you said that you were competitive in math and football when you were a child. Um, I was wondering when you first learned about math, complex math. Yeah, that's a great question. So. My math journey was an interesting one. When I was little, my mom would buy me like puzzle books. Like I would do like, you know, like, first of all, like really basic puzzle books and then things like Martin Gardner puzzle books, which I really enjoyed. We would, uh, we would like have game night every Friday night. And we would play board games and we would always play like quantitative board games like uh, Monopoly, for example. You know, this is sort of a game where yes, there's chance, but if you're competitive, you really want to win. You have to think strategically and mathematically, which, you know, the first time I lost, I was not happy. So, you, know, I, you know, I lost and I said, wow, what decisions did I make? What did I do? What could I have done better? In what ways was I sort of suboptimal? And I was trying to think sort of quantitatively. And, Mom, how old was I? Five Kind of way, but he has always been very, very competitive. <laughs> Pat, 
to actually say that John may claim to have mellowed significantly, but... I, I have mellowed You have mellowed significantly. Have mellowed significantly. Have mellowed significantly. <laughs> um, however, I play tennis, and when I go hit with someone, I'll come back, and they'll say, who won? And I'll say, oh, we were just hitting. And he says, every time, someone always wins. <laughs> <laughs> many, maybe too many years of football. I don't know what that's going to be. But, uh, no, one thing I will say that uh, it's good to be competitive, but uh, if you're going to be very competitive and if you are sort of trying to be very good in some competitive endeavor, the right way to be competitive, at least in my opinion, and the way that sort of I try to be competitive, is that. You should always look back on your performance and think, how could I have performed better? How could have I how could I have done something better? And in general, if it's some endeavor in which you have an opponent, your opponent should always be faceless and nameless, in my opinion. When you sort of think about how you perform, it should be about you, the things that you did, the things that you could control. Your opponent is just an opponent. It's not you're angry at your opponent, you're angry that your opponent beat you. You're angry that you didn't do the best that you could. You're angry that you think you could have performed possibly better. The moment I believe that you start focusing on sort of it being this person beat me, you're sort of missing the point about how to use this competitiveness to improve. Uh. Hi, my, my question was, um, I was wondering at any time, whether it be in the professional level or even playing in college, um, if your teammates were um, supportive of your passion and, um, and, and if they weren't, how did you kind of um, combat, you know, doing what you love, but also maybe wanting to be accepted by, you know, the guys? Yeah, that's a great question and that's a great point. I'm sorry that I don't have a great answer to your great question. Because <laughs> They all did really accept sort of me doing math and uh well, can I interject and say not when you were young. Well, I mean I wasn't playing football. Right. Yeah. Okay, this so was, never mind. Yeah, this was I wasn't I wasn't on a sports team this one. Sorry, I feel apologies for the interruption. No, 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 no. <laughs> but uh no, like my entire career playing football, I have to say that I've always just been one of the guys. And one thing that I enjoy about football is that often when you're on a football team, people don't care too much about the things you're doing outside of football. What they care the most about is what type of teammate are you? What type of player are you? And you know, because I like to believe I was a good player and I was a good teammate, people were actually interested in the things I was doing off the field. My teammates, you know, these were my best friends in college, and uh, they know all about sort of the math I do, and they sort of they thought it was really cool, actually. It's really rare to hit a capstone achievement in one career, much less two. Um, there aren't that many people who become professional sports players, uh, and there are just as few people who get academic PhDs. Um, I was talking to my son about why I found that inspiring about it earlier tonight. Uh, and my mind immediately uh, jumped to Brian May, who had a phenomenal career with Queen, I'm sure he went through Queen, um, but a lot of people don't know that he's also a PhD astrophysicist who just had a mission go up into space. Uh, so I was wondering what kinds of people inspired you that had been able to take that same that you were talking about earlier that your, your trainer had instilled upon you um, and clearly helped shape you not just as a football player, as a mathematician, but as a person to have that kind of, I know I failed, but I'm going to get up again and I'm going to succeed the next time. Because you have to do that in both endeavors. Who do you find inspired you? Sadly, I don't think I don't think I really had a role model in that sort of aspect of my life. I had 
sort of, I had a role model, a guy by the name of Dean Kaloshin, in terms of seeing a mathematician and seeing what type of mathematician I would like to be. But in terms of seeing someone's sort of pure sort of grit and determination, I'm really hard pressed to think of a role model, but I have to say that, I mean, I guess my role model was my strength and conditioning coach. I mean, this guy was tough as nails, and let me tell you, this man terrorized me in the best way possible. I mean, what what's his name? Uh, John Thomas. He terrorized me in the best way possible, and lots of the things that sort of John did with me, we could not write about in the book. <laughs> but let me tell you, I am so much better for it. And he is sort of, I'd say he is sort of like one of my biggest role models in terms of sort of, yeah, in terms of the things we've been discussing. Well, <clears throat> since there since there are two of you there, I feel like I'm entitled to ask two questions. <laughs> So I'll, I'll start with Louisa and just ask if you can say a few sentences about yourself, your career, and how it perhaps to what extent it relates to joining forces on the book and so forth. And then I'll let me get out my second question so you can decide how to time. Question for John is um, in teaching that, in learning that when you were a kid and coming up and so forth. Uh, interested in your thoughts on uh, kind of well, it's not not so much to some extent applied math versus uh, versus theoretical math, but in more in terms of whether there whether how important it is in order to get the most uh, the broadest audience to have a sort of physical representation, so that intuition plays heavily into. Understanding that versus uh, getting into um, more abstract aspects, proving theorems or, uh, or whatever, as opposed to engineering problems or football parabolic trajectory problems. <laughs> uh, sure, I'll quickly. Um, I have two other books. Um, one is uh, about four brothers in World War One. Um, two were pacifists and two were soldiers. And the other one is a biography of Louisa. Wait, uh, these four brothers, did any of them have any relation? <laughs> one of them was my great grandfather. <laughs> with um, so it's. Uh, and could you tell us about? Uh, his name was Norman Thomas. He was a, a socialist, which is a, a complicated word, I guess. Um, but um, he was a very. Um, these four brothers really cared about doing the right thing. Um, and they cared very deeply about um, how to follow what they felt was their duty um, at a time of incredible um, pressure and stress. I mean, World War One, the mobilization of this country was unbelievable. I mean, really unprecedented. And um, obviously, World War Two followed, but we haven't really seen the like of it since. And it was this very kind of um, vivid example of people who loved each other and respected each other and really different things coming together and trying to work out how to um, how to do what they thought was best but how also not to sort of tear apart um, and then my second book was a biography of uh, Louise Kappen Adams who's John Quincy Adams wife and who was a um, really really fascinating woman who's been largely overlooked by history um, she did some important things, but she was really more interesting to me because she had this really vivid inner life, which she wrote a lot about. Um, and so I was able to use her memoirs and poems and letters and diaries and, and really kind of um, see the early Republic through her eyes and how complicated and, and messy and interesting and thrilling it was. Um, and also actually tr it's transatlantic, so anyway, I can get it carried away. Um, and while I was waiting for Conscience to come out, I was playing a lot of tennis, and uh, I started writing about tennis, um, and it turns out that I love writing about tennis. I still love writing about tennis, and I still do a lot of it, um, and that brought me to Grantland, and um, I wrote, started writing about some other sports with them, and now I'm at the New Yorker as well. Uh,
Uh, to answer your question for me, I think it's actually quite important that uh, that when we learn mathematics, especially earlier on when we learn a concept for the first time, it's often helpful to have some idea of how this relates to the physical world. And I think this is important because sometimes when you just teach math theoretically, just you know, from basic principles all the way through, somehow kids get misled about how math was discovered and like what the process of getting to the mathematics that we have today was. And really, a bunch of like guys didn't just like sit around and say like, oh, let's define these axioms. One plus one is two, and two plus two is four, and let's just work with all these theoretical things. They came up with math to solve real world problems. This is where math came from. I mean, math sort of like the first sort of math documents came from, I think, Egypt. And uh, at the time, these documents were talking about how to multiply. And why were why did they have this document about how to multiply in like, I think it was like 1500 BC? Because they wanted to know how to divide things up amongst a group of people. They wanted to know if you have like 10 loaves of bread, how do you break it up among nine people? If you have a, I think this is actually an example, if you have like 100 loaves of bread, you have two groups of people, how do you distribute it amongst the two groups if one group is larger than the other? How do you decide how much each group gets? That's where the first recorded sort of history of the first recorded document of mathematics, that's where it comes from. So, I mean, mathematics really came out of a need for people to be able to solve problems using some universal language. And math is the universal language that we have to solve problems in this world. And this is what it was born out of. And so it seems only right that when very, very young people are taught this tool, they should probably also see some of the things that we created this tool for in the first place. Otherwise, they see a tool without what is what without sort of like the the application which seems you know a little strange know that sort of you know all of this sort of pure mathematics and all of this rigorous foundation this came a lot later like know that in my opinion in many ways math did not have like a solid solid footing even as like early even as like late as like the uh like the late 1800s. Like there were a lot of concepts in math that were not like well defined and made rigorous. For instance, probability was not a rigorous theoretical thing at the end of the 1800s. This didn't happen until I believe like the early, I don't know, I believe, <laughs> no, but did I, I should be, but I believe in like the early 1900s when they sort of like really defined like what does it mean to be a probability? And this came much later. It's not like no one was using probabilities until the like early 1900s. No, they were sort of using it as a tool. And then later people sort of came and looked at those tools and said, let's take all these tools and let's try to sort of make them rigorous, make them follow some sort of higher structure. But they didn't start with the higher structure. And so I think that's important for young people to understand when they're sort of going through that. Time for one more question. Can we make it two? There's one person on. It'll be okay. quick. Okay. Is this allowed? Okay. okay. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I have another math education question. Um, and I just had an interesting if you talked a little bit about like disparities in educational energy resources. I think the posters I knew are cool. Um, but just to like maybe complicate that notion a little bit, as I mean, do you feel like there are ways that that kind of discipline itself can be more culturally aware and responsive, um, or at least the teaching of that as a practice can be more inclusive? Can you, I'm really, I'm really interested in your question. Can you give me an example? Sure. So, so that I make sure I, I follow. Try. Yeah. I know a lot about this. Okay. I, I had a good friend in college as a math major, and so he did. Do you have to come on and be 
Oh, Mona's, yeah. yeah. Mona's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I just, you know, I was there, so I'm glad I can see it now. So, the thesis was on just all indigenous community in LA. Um, and it's for some reason, the like natural way math is approaching our cultures through these 12. Um, oh, that's I really know, interesting. It's really, it's really cool. Yeah. I've always thought of like these things kind of natural, so realizing that it's like, it's always kind of instructed as normal. It made me wonder if there are ways that math as a discipline is sort of like instructed in a way that is not responsive to culture in a way that it could be. I get what you're saying. I. I think that there are definitely. Like there are definitely sort of mathematical conventions that come out of sort of a certain culture being in power at a certain time. Like if you look at mathematics, you will see our cultural history in mathematics based on certain things being defined a certain way because of these were the people who had influence at that time and this is how they decided it was going to be. And so the fact that we use base 10 completely arbitrary. In my opinion, any base that's sort of like, I have to admit, base 12 is a little strange. It's a little strange. <laughs> You're putting your hands up, yes, I'm, uh, I'm aware of this. But uh, yeah, I mean, he's putting his hands up because we have we have 10 figures. But uh, you put your fingers and toes together, you have 20. So, you know, I don't, could be base 20, could be base five. Uh, in many ways, I will sort of always say the most natural base is these two. I think that most mathematicians would agree with me that this is sort of the most natural, but it's base 10 because someone decided it. And there is cultural sort of history in that. And, and I guess I, I don't know if the sort of underlying cultural influence that different groups of people had on mathematics, does this negatively impact certain cultures when they learn mathematics? I mean, this small community is definitely an example, but is this a sort of, is this a widespread thing? I, I don't know, and sort of this group of people you're talking about, should we convert them to base 10 because the rest of the world uses it? Should we, should they be taught in base 12? I, I legitimately don't think I'm qualified to answer that question. Like, I, I really don't, but you no, know, it's a good question, and I don't have a good answer. And I would say that I like to believe that although a lot of things in mathematics have been heavily dependent on sort of cultural things going on at the time, I like to think that mathematics as it is formed today based on its axiomatic foundations, is very much a discipline and a sort of st structure that uh, is independent or as close to independent of culture as you can be in this world today, in my opinion. Yeah. Thank you for the question. So um, there's no I in football, but there is team in mathematics. So I'm interested, you, you mentioned earlier as a, that you got into math because it was something that you did alone. Yes. And obviously you played a team sport. So can you talk about, I guess, the dichotomy of those two and which, what is your preference? Yes, so even to this day, I have to say, I really enjoy doing mathematics. It's a very, it's a very personal thing for me. It really is. And, uh, and part of this is, based on how I learned it when I was little. Also in part, it's based on sort of my first mathematical mentor in university. He was sort of a Russian mathematician. And so I had a very sort of uh, Russian sort of like upbringing in my sort of collegiate math career. Like it was very much a Russian type of school, very, you know, you learn on your own, reading a book somewhere, like, and then you come and you ask questions, but you know, you do your thinking elsewhere, and uh, I'm still like that to a sort of large degree. Different mathematicians sort of have a different style. This is just my style, but uh, 
I have to say, being a part of a team, this is an important thing. And this is something I really enjoy football. And sort of for young people, I would say, you don't have to play football. I don't care if you play football. I don't care if you play sport. Okay, I think it should be, it'll be good for you to sort of be active, to sort of work your body in some way. I think this is good for you, but what I want for every young person is to be a part of a group at some point in your life. Be a part of a team. It doesn't need to be the football team. It doesn't need to be the volleyball team. It can be the debate team. It can be chess club. It can be drama. But I find that it's important to understand the dynamics of a team. The idea of being a part of a bigger whole where you're working towards the shared goal that might take precedence over your sort of individual wants and needs to some extent. And this is something that it's very hard to teach in a classroom, in school, and I think that this is sort of a crucial skill that people need when they leave high school, when they leave college and they join the workforce. And so I think this is something I recommend to all of us. Quick housekeeping things before they start signing.